Hello and welcome to another fast interview from New Zealand uh, during this nation's general election. While I'm here I'm speaking with a number of candidates and activists so we can get an idea of politics in New Zealand, what are the big issues for the campaign, but also, uh, most importantly, what Australians can learn from New Zealand politics. Today I'm with Jordan Williams, who is the Executive Director of the New Zealand Taxpayers Union, uh, who were founded in 2013. Their stated goal is to expose government extravagance, uh, waste and misspending. Hi Tim. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So I guess I'll start from the, the beginning, you're a relatively new organisation, so why, uh, why did you feel the need that this organisation needed to be started? Um, well, my co-founder Dave Farah uh, and I uh, thought that the New Zealand really lacked a strong activist voice on the centre-right. Uh, we had a, um, the form of the New Zealand Business Roundtable wrapped up um, after the uh, founder of that or the long-time executive director passed away in 2011. Uh, the New Zealand Initiative was born out of that. They're more the sort of think tank style uh, organisation. What we don't have was a pure activist model um, uh, that uh, is in the media that is constantly uh, pushing that fiscally conservative message and that radical idea that you spend your money better than politicians and bureaucrats. Uh, one thing I've noticed during my trip to New Zealand, and well, it's it's really shocked me, is that how unaccountable the bureaucracy is to the people. There's there seems to be this divorce from reality that the the you elect the politicians, but it seems the bureaucracy they still decide, you know, how the policies imp implemented and oversee their budget. Is is that what you? Well, it's really one of our roles is that we're in the media nearly every day exposing government waste. Uh, we filed last year more uh, requests for official information, or I think you call them freedom of information requests, than any other organisation in the country, including uh, the opposition parties. Um, at the stage of the modern media now, very low resources and newsrooms to be able to do investigative journalism, we see our role is to um, ensure that there is more accountability um, from both politicians but also bureaucrats uh, as you point out. In a sign of success, it's very hard to measure success in a sort of organisation, but we've had now a couple of instances where the Taxpayers Union has been referred to in official documents relating to the pros and cons of um, whether to uh, implement or, um, or uh, approve a particular area of spending. Now there's no better endorsement than that than when uh, bureaucrats are writing that if we do this we might be criticised by the Taxpayers Union that shows that we're getting the message through and it shows that the bureaucrats know that there's someone watching over their shoulder. Yeah, it's certainly, if you've got uh, the politicians and even better the bureaucrats scared, that's definitely a sign of success. Now, how do you see the uh, state of economic freedom in New Zealand? Obviously, New Zealand uh, is high up on the, the economic freedom uh, chart and obviously the New Zealand economy went through a radical transformation mm. in the the 1980s uh, under both uh, Labour and National Governments, obviously there was Rogenomics and then I learnt of a new term, uh, Ruthanasia, that, that, that came after. Uh, but how do you see, uh, into, in the present time, economic freedom? Well, New Zealand had a, such a radical uh, uh, shift because of how much trouble we were in. You know, we were days from calling in the IMF. Um, there is, uh, the, I think, t to give Australians an illustration of just how bad it was. Our reserve bank was um, was so low on foreign currency, they were calling around uh, uh, embassies and high commissions overseas to find out what the limits on their credit cards were sort of thing. It was just banana republic stuff. So yes, we had a radical transformation uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, and then the National Party, our conservative um, uh, party, uh, the Prime Minister sort of lost the yumph. Um, fired um, Ruth Richardson or, um, uh, in the early 90s and then they sort of coasted on for another four years as a sort of classic uh, conservative government not really achieving a lot. Then of course we had Helen Clark, didn't roll back uh, any of the neoliberal, uh, neoliberal or open market reforms but New Zealand's really been in a state of drift ever since and including um, especially under John Key. You know, hard issues like our superannuation age and 
always been kicked to touch, always pushed out 20 years. Uh, and it's a real problem that organisations like us face um, is, you know, Australians and Americans see New Zealand as this libertarian utopia that, we've, that we rank highly on uh, economic freedom. But uh, there is definitely a sense of complacency um, in New Zealand uh, that sort of everything's been done, we've achieved, well it hasn't. Um, there are whole areas of the economy which were never reformed, um, education being the most obvious, we are still almost entirely rela um, reliant on the state. And we're also now facing an election with a, a um, neo-socialist leader of the Labour Party. She's 37, she's the four, her only, her biggest achievement on her CV, other than a, um, than a Bachelor of Communications from a second tier university, is she was head of the um, International Youth Socialists Union. You know, I mean, that, that, that economic freedom that uh, we take for granted is a concern because we take it for granted. Uh, it's certainly, it's a trend that's uh, obviously not unique to New Zealand. Obviously in Australia our Labour Party has turned far to the left and there's obviously Jeremy Corbyn in the UK and it seems the, the, the Tony Blair or even Helen Clark mm. Social Democrat uh, style of uh, centre-left government is, is really going out the window, which is a cause for concern. You know, I, I think that Tony Blair was to the right of Helen Clark. Uh, there is a, I mean, the Clark's government ran the country a little bit like conservative governments, you know, know that, that the hangover from the 80s is New Zealanders were very, very cautious of any sort of radical reform. Um, and, and for the first time, really, from the left, we sort of, because the new generation's coming through, that don't, don't remember the um, reforms of the, um, of the 80s, uh, we are sort of flirting with ideas of radical socialism again, and uh, that's pretty concerning. Yes, uh, I, I certainly agree with, with your analysis there. Now, uh, let's uh, talk about your work. You mentioned, obviously, that uh, some of your successes. Can you um, talk about some of the, the campaigns you run? Uh, before you were just telling me about uh, a very hilarious uh, campaign that, that you run. Yes, yeah, so our, um, our sort of principal campaign is what we call our war on waste. And so that is, um, I mentioned that you know, we're drawing the public's attention to uh, the government or bureaucrats wasting people's money, and it's to reinforce that radical idea that you spend your money better than politicians and bureaucrats. So as an example of that, we have a, um, a six foot high uh, pig mascot, uh, Porky the Waste Hater we, we call him, and um, Porky and I get into a tuxedo and Porky gets dressed up and we go and uh, gate crash government departments to award them special certificates of achievement uh, when they've wasted money. So for example just down the road is our Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment. Um, they got um, kitted out new offices which with hair straighteners in the bathrooms. They had a $120,000 television screen in the, um, uh, in the reception area so we um, rock on up uh, with this big novelty certificate with a news crew from, um, from one of our major news networks and um, go and present them this award. A few weeks ago we went to, um, Porky and I went to Rotorua. Rotorua is New Zealand's capital for volcanic activity and volcanic mud and geysers, uh, but the council there was uh, hosting a mud festival and rather than use local mud they were importing $90,000 of mud from South Korea. I mean, this was like um, uh, like uh, Saudi Arabia importing sand. It's just totally nuts. Now we, because of that um, piss take uh, uh, certificate uh, ceremony that we literally did in the council chamber asking for the mayor and they duck and weave and, 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 and won't come out of their offices, uh, we managed to push it out to a national news story and won it. Now, $90,000 is a significant amount, um, but in the grand schemes of government it's not absolutely enormous, but it does reinforce the core premise again that politicians and bureaucrats need to be held to account and be more responsible with um, their agency role of spending other people's money. And so if we've got to get into pick costumes to go and do that, you know, in the same way as Greenpeace is very effective for left-wing campaigns with their polar bear costumes. You know, it, we apply that same business model, but on a centre-right perspective, um, which I think that, that generally the left are better at that sort of activist type um, activity, and that's what makes our group an activist organisation, um, a taxpayer group, 
rather than the traditional think tank centre-right model? Oh, well, it's certainly the first time I've seen a, a centre-right organisation engage in, in, in those type of media activities. So I, I, def I definitely think that it's an idea that, that can be exported to uh, other countries, including Australia, because uh, if you're drawing attention to, to waste, you've, I mean, it's... It's, it's very, it uh, can be depressing sometimes looking at all, all the ways you may as well do it in an ent entertaining manner. Yeah, well it's about, I mean, our organisation, you know, we, uh, we measure success, or one of the metrics that we, um, that we measure how we're doing is that, is that column inches. So another um, stunt uh, we did to highlight one of our campaigns around hidden taxes, that just behind you is an infographic on the percentage of when you fill up your tank of gas, it's now about 50% tax. And you put eighty dollars of gas in the car. Um, we'd go and ask people at a petrol station again with a um, with a film crew from one of the major TV stations. You know, um, sir, you're putting eighty bucks in the car. I'll give you this twenty dollars, or I'll give you what the tax is, and you'd guess. You know, well, what one do you want to take? And then we'd calculate, and we'd get your reaction, and literally give you the amount of tax back. Now, for that, you know, a thousand bucks giving away cash for the for the um, for the tax you, because of Twitter and the um, the local paper, you know, you get people coming to the gas station and wanting to fill up their cars and the like. You know, but we get a national news story, again, reminding people of those hidden taxes uh, and driving the message that actually government likes to sort of sneak these costs past um, and, and um, to get people to demand better value for money for their tax dollar. And you do receive feedback fr from the public? Yes, yeah, so we've got 27,000 members and supporters uh, across our uh, campaign group. So there's a national organisation, the Taxpayers Union. We also have an Auckland group specifically, um, the focus of the Auckland Council. Um, we don't have um, states in New Zealand, but Auckland Council, uh, about a third of New Zealand's population is, um, uh, is underneath it. So it effectively is the closest thing we have to a state government, um, and we've got a dedicated group of volunteers up there um, that operate that organisation as well. But we run them in, um, in tandem, very similar campaign uh, messages, purposes, and um, and methodology. And obviously, uh, New Zealand's in the middle of an election campaign. We've mentioned it briefly. Uh, National Party government they've done okay, but as as you mentioned, Jacinta Ardern, she is you know very left wing. She the the nicknames for her comrade Jacinta, and also Tax Cinta. She seems to want to uh, tax everything, but. Um, what do you see as the, the main issues that you think the, the party should address in this election? Well, up until, up until about 72 hours ago, it looked like it was, um, uh, it was going to be a Labour-led government uh, tomorrow week. Uh, but the, because Labour have been quite uh, taken for granted um, a, what their intentions on tax, they basically said to the public, well, we're not going to tell you what we're going to do on tax, we're going to give it to a working group. Um, it's really swung back the other way. Um, Jacinda is very young. Uh, she's only um, been in the job, well, I think, for less than six weeks. Um, it, she has absolutely catapulted Labour into a position where um, it's now very, very competitive. Um, but the sort of that bump is just starting to, um, you know, reading the tea leaves of the polls because they're very inconsistent. They're a bit all over the place. Um, but it looks like that shine is just starting to um, to wear off. So we're working. You know, our role in an election um, is we run an election bribeometer, which um, your viewers may want to check out at um, bribe-o-meter.co.nz, bribeometer.co.nz. Uh, and what that shows, what we've been working hard, is our um, economist has been tracking all the election promises across all the because um, we don't just have two main parties. There's a whole lot of um, coalition partners because of the nature of our voting system, uh, tracking the costs of all the manifestos uh, and then converting that to a per household cost. And again, just arming voters with the, um, with the facts around what the costs of those policies that every po um, party is promising. And um, so far we've had tens of thousands of New Zealanders visit that. We're running um, full page ads across all the um, major metropolitan papers next week. We want to turn that into hundreds of thousands of viewers uh, for that bribeometer, as we had it just prior to the last election. And what's your uh, assessment of the, the past nine years of national national party government? Because obviously, um, as an outsider, particularly coming from Australia, where the budget's in terrible shape, mm. um, we look at the New Zealand government, and they seem to have done 
you know, as a slow, steady job, they've got the budget into surplus, but how do you see it? Well, they've done a slow, steady job to nowhere. That's the problem. Um, so our donor base is largely people from the centre-right, um, uh, uh, and there is uh, a little bit of crossover to National Party donors, and certainly the feedback we've received is that you know, John Key had all this enormous capital, you know, he, man he was very, very good at managing expectations and, and selling it to the public. But then we got to the end, and what was it all for? Uh, that uh, New Zealand's long-term fiscal problems, particularly around the retirement age, just hasn't, haven't been dealt with. Um, they probably rightfully borrowed quite extensively through the GFC and the um, Christchurch earthquake, which you can, um, I don't, um, don't underappreciate the cost of the Christchurch earthquake, our second largest city, um, you know, CBD's... Um, the whole CBD being rebuilt, uh, and yet none of that uses an opportunity to actually reform or move forward a um, a genuine centre right uh, um, uh, policy platform. So very much that conservative um, type government. Um, they sell themselves on better managers rather than better ideas. You know, they're really suffering at the moment because they haven't dealt with the housing crisis. You know, instead they've thrown money as conservative governments have around the world of throwing money on the supply side with, for example, first home buyer grants, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, when every single expert tells them for the last 10 years it is a supply side problem, it's our um, local government restricting land, it's our red tape, our um, resource management act, which is our planning laws, um, which means that we're simply not building enough houses. The national have not had the political courage to deal with it, and now they're paying the price for it, and probably deservedly so. Uh, for, for people like you and me, the solution to the housing crisis, I, I was shocked when I learned Auckland homes average a million dollars. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? But yeah, the, the, the solution's there. It's just that, yeah, the, the politicians, they're, they're just afraid of you know, proposing the, the solution. Well, it's also intergenerational um, that, that for the sort of baby boomer that vote typical National Party voter um, probably doesn't, wouldn't want their house price to go down. Um, but in reality, for the very brief time before there was a by-election and they lost the majority with, um, with, um, with the ACT Party, which is who they who, um, yeah, sort of one seat, almost independent, uh, on the, um, to the right of National, um, they really just didn't have a plan to execute to actually fix it. They've tinkered a heck of a lot, they've put endless press statements about it, but they haven't fixed the fundamentals, which I think we counted that, that there's been 19 reports um, on how to fix the housing crisis, and all of them say pretty much the same thing, um, and yet they just haven't delivered. Uh, so they've talked about it, uh, they haven't uh, fixed the housing pr um, crisis, uh, and you know, I mean, but as I say, you know, that's usually the default position for centre right parties. Um, most, um, especially in New Zealand, of course, it was the, a Labour government. That um, really reformed, um, you know, introduced the necessary um, neoliberal reforms in the 80s. The um, Nats continued it for a few years until they um, uh, until they uh, lost their courage. Now we've just seen successive governments sort of just managing um, rather than putting us on to uh, the sort of Singaporean model, which is what um, John Key and the National Party talked about last time they were in opposition. And obviously, the the key to implementing. Uh the, the reforms that you and I would as see lead to economic prosperity is obviously economic education. You've got to have the, the public on side. And I know in Australia it's very hard to uh, convince people of the benefits of free markets and capitalism is still seen as a, a dirty word. What's the attitude of New Zealanders like when they hear the word you know, free market, privatisation? Well, I deliberately use the word neoliberal because I want to start owning that because we've accepted the left using this neoliberal straw man and painting them as the boogeyman. You know, that, um, that actually most of the reform, in fact all of the reforms of the 80s weren't overturned by Helen Clark's Labour government. You know, so we do accept they're a good, they're a good thing. So it's a bit rich for these same politicians to sort of slate the neoliberal, uh, neoliberals. Yet they accept the fundamental, um, uh, uh, fundamentals of the idea. Um, but I sort of part of the, my motivation setting up this organisation with David was that we just haven't been turning up to the fight. You know, when uh, when the Minister of Finance issues a budget on Budget Day, at two o'clock, when he gets up and starts his speech, you know, immediately. There are hundreds of press releases from 
every organisation under the sun, you know, wanting more money for their pet cause, you know, I'll save the albino snail on the west coast or whatever. But there's not an equal side fronting up to the debate from the centre right. Business groups are often, particularly in New Zealand, uh, are often reluctant to stick their head above the parapet. You know, they fought in the 80s and 90s for those reforms because individual business champions stuck their head up, fought for better public policy, and that's what societies need. Um, unfortunately, that just isn't happening as much on the centre right now. Um, and I mean, we're on a pathway to losing if we're not turning up to the fight. So we need more organisations. We need to encourage you know, a, a centre-right media to balance the, the left-wing bias. We need um, organisations like you know, the think tanks on the centre-right, but also the lobby groups um, and the talking heads and the business leaders that are willing to put the facts out there around why markets are better, um, how um, neo, the, the Washington consensus or neoliberal um, consensus since the mid-80s have brought a billion people out of um, extreme poverty. Uh, we need to be selling that message much better because otherwise we just give it up and, um, and we just pick up, or the media just pick up um, what they've read in the, um, in the Guardian. And I use inequality as an example. You know, every day you open the paper in New Zealand and there's talk about growing inequality. There's a concern, including from business people, growing inequality. You look at the data, it's just total horseradish. New Zealand's inequality stopped going up in about 1990, midway through our full economic reforms. And what we're picking up is a rhetoric from America. You know, it's like um, it's like uh, commentator, read it, you know, monkey read it in the Guardian, monkey write it for New Zealand sort of thing. It, the data just does not fit the American narrative that so often comes through. So one of the roles of our organisation is actually arm people with the facts that New Zealand does have an inequality problem, but it is post-housing cost inequality, which is growing, income inequality, which is growing. Actual income inequality stopped growing on, I think it's about 9 out of 10 official measures, uh, since those neoliberal reforms. And so we need to be selling that. Oh, well, it sounds like that you've already made a, a, a good start and had uh, some successes, so well done on that, and thank you for, for talking with The Unshackled. Thanks for your time. And good luck for the future. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.